All right. In this video, I want to talk about another gospel. What is another gospel? Well, another gospel is any gospel that is not actually the true gospel. The gospel for this time of grace. The, the church age here. As we read over here in Galatians chapter 1. And at verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ onto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel onto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. What he means by accursed is condemned. Let him go to hell. Because that's exactly where he's going and where he's leading people. Because he's preaching to them another gospel. Now, Key points to understand here is in verse 6 where he says, They removed you from the grace of Christ. So this is a key point we're going to talk about. And they pervert the gospel of Christ. So they pervert the good news of our salvation coming from Jesus the Christ here. And they remove you from the grace so what we're going to do is we're actually going to get into the gospel that Paul preached and to understand the grace and how today this is being perverted. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, plainly tell us what the gospel is. It says here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, and by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached on you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered on you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we see here that the Gospel is, Christ died for our sins. So you need to understand that you're condemned. You're condemned to death and hell, and Jesus died in your place for your sins. And he was buried and he resurrected the third day. And this is where you are justified, as we're told over here in Romans chapter 4, where it's telling us about how Abraham was deemed righteous by God. God gave Abraham his righteousness because he believed him when he told him he would have as many children as there are stars in the sky. It says here, verse 22, And therefore it was imputed to Abraham for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So we see here the gospel restated. Those of us who believe it are like Abraham, where we are believing and trusting God. And for that faith, without works, we are imputed with God's righteousness. That's why in the very next chapter, it straight up tells us at verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. We see here by the grace and the gift of righteousness. So we are gifted with God's righteousness. It is not our own righteousness. It's God's righteousness. It's about God in his holy, holy, holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his mercy, his great grace, his finished work of salvation. And it's about his love for us. It's not about our love for him. It's not about our love for others. It's not about what we have done for God and everybody else. It's about God. It's about his righteousness and how he saves us by giving it to us. Right? 
and it tells us, beginning of Romans 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have access by faith to the grace. So to receive the grace, you have to have faith, which means you believe and trust God. That's what faith is. Just like it tells us over here in Ephesians 2, it's telling us this whole thing all over again. At verse 8 and 9 it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. So here, the grace comes from God. The only thing coming from us here is faith. And it restates this by saying, And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see here how, again how we, Paul is telling us that we're saved by this gift. The gift of righteousness, this grace that we haven't earned or deserved, because that contradicts the meaning of the word grace. Like I said, these people try to remove you from grace and pervert the gospel. So we need to understand what is going on by understanding the gospel and what it means to obey the gospel. Real quickly, I wanted to go over that because there are some people who say, well, there's work involved because you've got to obey the gospel. Well, the gospel, the only thing it's telling you to do is to believe. As it says here in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, And saying, The time was fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Repent means to change your mind. God repented. Genesis 6 is the first mention of repent, and God was repenting about creating mankind. So what it's telling you here is to Change your mind and believe the gospel. Turn from unbelief to belief in the gospel. That's obeying. So with that being said, let's talk about grace. Here we are in Romans chapter 11. And we're told here at verse 6, And if by grace... Then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So see, you see here that Paul is saying, okay, if it, this, this thing done here is by grace, then it has nothing to do with works. If you put works into it, then it has nothing to do with grace anymore. Showing us that grace and works are polar opposites. Right? And then he says, but if it be of works then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So here he's restating it, saying, hey, now if it's by works, then you can't say it's of grace, because then work isn't in work anymore. And this will become clear when you understand that grace, in this example, let's say it's some white paint, and works is black paint. And separated, you can see, they're obviously different. You've got white paint, black paint. But then you take a little bit of the grace and a little bit of the works, you put it together, you mix it together, you get gray, right? So it's no longer works because it's not black, and it's no longer grace because it's not white. It's something completely different because it's not works, it's not grace, it's this mix that shouldn't be mixed together here, right? Because it, now what is it? It's not either one, it's something completely different, it doesn't even make sense anymore. Which is what happens when you work, mix works and grace together. Such as uh, another witness to this is Romans chapter 4 verse 4 where it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So what this is telling us is that if you work for it, such as you went to your job all week and you worked the whole week, your, your 9 to 5, 40 hours a week, and you get paid, then your reward is not reckoned of grace, as in it's not given to you, oh, you, you didn't earn it. No, you it's indebted to you. So if you work for it, the reward is indebted to you, it's owed to you. But let's say you miss a week of work because of an injury or something along those lines, and your boss still gives you the paycheck. Well, then you've just been given grace because you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't merit it. The boss was just like, you know what? I'm going to take care of my employees. There's an injury here. 
I'm going to make sure you, you got this week pay because I know you probably need it. Right? That'd be grace. And he could do this even if you were a crappy worker. One of his worst workers. Somebody he was planning on firing. Right? But since you got sick or whatever happened to you, let's say it wasn't at work so that you can't sue, right? Something you did while grilling or something, right? Going fishing and something weird happened. That's grace because you didn't earn the paycheck, right? So now how would you have a paycheck based on works and grace? It wouldn't work. It's one or the other. You either earned it or you didn't. Right? It can't be both. So, with that being said, I wanted to look up some definitions of grace. Here's a, since I'm using the King James, let's go to the King James Dictionary here. Uh, and it tells us here at definition two, appropriately the free unmerited love and favor of God, the spring and source of all that benefits men uh, receive from him. And I think it's this number three here, no, four here. The application of Christ's righteousness to the sinner. Right? And I'm just going to go through in case you wanted to look at the other definitions. Like verse uh, number nine is really good. Eternal life, final salvation. Right? Uh, Ten. Mercy, pardon. Right? Which... Mercy and grace are intertwined, where mercy is somebody deserves something like hell in this example. But you receive mercy, which means you don't get what you deserve. You deserve hell, but you're not getting it. That's mercy. Right? And then grace is getting what you don't deserve, which would be heaven. You don't deserve heaven. If you think you deserve heaven, you're a very prideful person. You don't deserve heaven, so there's your grace. Right? And if you want mercy and grace... Well, then you should be merciful and gracious to others, where you think, oh, they don't deserve heaven, so they shouldn't get it. They deserve hell, so they should get it. Well, then you should too, right? Because you're really no different than anybody else. But I'm just going to go through in case you wanted to pause and look at this. Look at the different uh, definitions here, here. But I think that is all of it. Oh, all right. It changed to graced, so we'll stop there. And I'll slowly go back up so you can pause it at some other time and look at all the different ones if that's something you wanted to do. But this is av1611.com. I believe it's a place where you can look up the 1611 definitions of words where you can look up something like unicorn and realize it's a rhinoceros. So when people say, there's no unicorns, the Bible ain't real. Okay. Well, it, it's a rhinoceros. And dragon just means a, a great lizard. You know, these, these kind of things. Uh, but anyway, kind of like you have a Komodo dragon, right? Something like that. Here's from a modern Merriam-Webster's dictionary. It says, unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Or again here, mercy, pardon. Mercy or pardon is not getting what you deserve, right? Unmerited means unearned, undeserved. And we can put that in right here just to show you that. See, unmerited, not adequately earned or deserved. So grace is not something you can earn or deserve. It's just given to you. So if you don't have to earn it or deserve it to receive it, you don't have to earn it and deserve it to keep it. Because that would contradict what it is. Because if you could lose it because you didn't earn it or deserve it, well then that wasn't grace. You shouldn't be calling it grace. You're misusing the words. You don't know how to use proper English. Now, this is just the Britannica, and I just wanted to show this because I thought it was interesting. And it says here, 
Um, right off the bat, grace in Christian theology, the spontaneous, unmerited gift of the divine favor in the salvation of sinners. And then the second part of the sentence, and the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. So here, we see that even here, it understands it's unmerited. An unmerited gift. Again, an undeserved, unearned gift. Which means it's not dependent on you repenting of all your sins and keeping the law and getting baptized and doing all the religious rituals and all the good works for your God and your fellow man, paying tithes and alms and this and that and what have you. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with God saying, here, I want to save you. And you saying, save me from what? And then you learn what? And then you're like, whoa, you want to save me from that? You want to spend eternity with me even though I did all these things and I deserve hell? You still want to die in my place and save me? And then you see how it's all about God and how great he is. It has nothing to do with you. Right? And that's where you can tell false gospels. Right? Before I continue, another gospel is going to make it not about God. Right? They make it not about God. They remove you from grace and they pervert the gospel of Christ. So continuing here, just wanted to make it clear that we receive the Spirit when we believe the gospel. It's not something that happens when we are water baptized because it's not about what we do. As Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is of them that perish foolishness, but unto us are saved, it is the power of God. So you see here he's saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news of our salvation, which is the preaching of the cross, and to us that are saved, that is the power of God. Because, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15, what the gospel is, the preaching of the cross, how Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification according to the scriptures. And if you're, unless your belief in this is in vain, it's what saves you. It doesn't say unless you sin and don't do the rituals and haven't been baptized and done all these other things, then it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't say that. It says what saves you unless your belief is in vain, as in it's a fake belief, or it's just a head knowledge, or you don't, you're just a pretender, you're fake, right? Just like taking the Lord's name in vain, you call yourself a Christian, but you're just calling yourself a Christian to fit in with society, to fit in with your family, to get some kind of political or financial benefit, then you're, you're taking it in vain, you don't really mean it. Kind of like someone who's marrying a man for his money. So you take on his name, not because you truly want to be with him, you truly love him and what have you. You're doing it because, oh, this person will take care of me. Well, then you're taking their name in vain, right? You don't really care about the name, right? And here in Galatians chapter 3, it tells us again, in the first verse, whoops, mouse started to stick there, where he tells us about the cross real quick. He says, O foolish Galatians who have to be witched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. So you see here he's talking about obeying the truth, and he's going to talk about real belieffully what that is. Obeying the truth is actually not doing the works. Not that you should go sin. If you think you are saved by your works, you're wrong. As he says here at verse 2, This only what I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So you see here, you didn't receive the Spirit because you kept the law and you did a good job of it. Just like Peter, he wasn't walking on the water because he was sinless and perfect. He was walking on the water simply by faith. And that's all of us. We're not sinlessly perfect. We shouldn't be walking on the water. Yet by faith we do. And that's an example of salvation where you don't fall into the abyss of hell simply by you believing and trusting God. 
has nothing to do with how good and great you are. It's about how good and great God is. As he goes on to say at verse 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect in the, by the flesh? Ye have suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. So you see here how he's telling them, hey, to actually obey the truth, you have to walk by faith, not by sight, to trust in God to save you, not in yourself, in you keeping the law. And I know a lot of groups would say that they're not under the law, or you don't have to keep the whole law, or this just means circumcision. No, it means the whole nine yards. So if you're saying just the Ten Commandments, just little pieces of the law, because you like to have a Catholic version of the law, that's all part of it. And Paul goes on at verse, I mean, chapter 5 here. And very important thing to understand here is verse 4. He says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And what did he say at the beginning? That you're removed from the grace of Christ. So you see, when you're trying to be justified by the law, instead of being justified by God, you're fallen from grace. When you're trying to be justified by works, you have fallen from grace, because grace is the opposite of works. So if you've fallen from grace, the only way to fall from grace is to not accept it, and to try to earn it and deserve it, to try to merit God's favor, instead of freely accepting the grace. Because grace is God's favor, but it's a type of favor that you cannot earn or deserve. And before I continue here, let me check my message here. All right. So, with all this being said, what is another gospel? Well, another gospel would be distorting grace. It would remove you from grace. So if there's a gospel that says, oh, you have to repent of all your sins before you can be saved. Well, that's another gospel. Oh, you have to be circumcised. You have to be water baptized. You have to be confirmed into our church. Well, that's removing you from grace. Because now it's about things you do, right? Or if they say, oh, yeah, well, you're saved by this. But now you have to prove it by producing the fruit and doing the good works and not habitually sinning and doing all these other things, such as keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, going to our church service and partaking of the Eucharist and saying your Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Well, that's another gospel because, again, it's about you and what you're doing for God and what you do for your fellow man to see. And it's not about God saving you anymore. It's not about grace because it's about you and what you're doing. Or what you're not doing. Right? So they, you see how they remove you from grace. And they do this subtly by either front-loading or back-loading works to the gospel. Sometimes it's putting the, the works into the gospel by saying, well, to prove you're saved and to keep it, you, you have to have these works. So it's kind of back-loading it, kind of front-loading it. But it's like, I like to say it's in the middle, where they're saying, oh yeah, you're, you're saved by this, but you've got to have these works to, uh, to prove it and maintain it, All right? Because that's usually the, the three main ways they get away from grace, is they'll say, you have to have the works before the gospel, so you have to repent of all your sins and do all these things. Or they'll, have, they'll say, oh, to prove you're actually saved, you've got to have fruit. Or they'll say, to keep your salvation, you have to do these things. So, one way or the other, they apply it to either the front or the back, or this kind of mix up version of it. So, right there, that's how you can tell another gospel. How else can you tell another gospel? Well, it's, it's quite similar, because once it's about your work, it's no longer about God, and how he saved you, it's about how... Either you're working with God to save you, or how you are doing it yourself. 
right? So it's diminishing what God has done to say that, oh, it wasn't good enough. He still needs your help. So you're lowering God. And it's not just about God anymore. You're jumping in trying to take some of that glory by saying, well, I helped him. So when you get to heaven, you'd be like, yeah, God saved me, but I helped him do it because look at all the stuff I did and the stuff I didn't do. I'm so great. So you're, you're trying to steal some of that glory from God. And sometimes it's just completely taking it from him where you have to be sinlessly perfect. And that's just the pride of Satan right there from Isaiah 14 saying, oh, I want to be like the most high and ascend up to heaven. And that's how a lot of people are today, a lot of Christians. Oh, I want to be sinlessly perfect. I want to be justified by the law. When no flesh is justified by the law, we're told that over and over in the New Testament. And you can clearly see how we're not in the Old Testament. And they're still going to say, well, me, I'm going to be the one to do it. Uh, well, Jesus was the only one to do it. So again, you're diminishing what God did and what only he could do. And you're putting yourself on that same level. So you see how, again, it's diminishing God and it's elevating man. So you see how it's a, another gospel. Right? And then they ultimately, like it says, not only do they remove you from grace, and they exalt God, I mean, exalt themselves over God, but they pervert the gospel of Christ. Where all these things that they're doing perverts it. Where it's a, another gospel, because it's not what we're clearly taught in the scriptures. That Jesus saved us. Right? They make it about something else. Whether it's about being part of their church and doing their rituals. Or like keeping the, the correct Sabbath day so that you, you, you're you sealed, even though we're told that we are sealed by the Spirit as soon as we believe the gospel. Right? We were already read Galatians chapter 3 where it said, did you receive the Spirit by faith or the works of the law? Well, by faith. But then they these people will turn around and contradict the scripture and say, oh, I'm sealed by keeping the law, by keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. But they don't realize the true Sabbath is resting in God's finished work of salvation he saved you and that's the eternal sabbath day where right here you enter into it ephesians 1 13 it says in whom ye also trusted i'm just going to say jesus because that's the context of this here you can go look if you want talking about christ so i'm going to say that just so you know what this sentence is talking about in jesus he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in jesus also after that you believed you were sealed with that holy spirit of promise so you see that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Ephesians 4.30 says that we're sealed under the day of redemption. So grieve not the Holy Spirit. And for some reason people say, well, you see, you grieve the Holy Spirit. And it's like, yeah, it does. Right? We, uh, I don't have anything to hide. Yeah, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You're like, see, so you can lose your salvation. That's not what this says. It doesn't say if you grieve the Holy Spirit, he leaves you and you're no longer sealed. No, a matter of fact, it says grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Because he's sealed to you until the day of redemption. The day of rede redemption is when Jesus comes to claim everything that he's redeemed at the cross. So you're saved. Done deal. Eternally secure. Can't be undone. That's why Jesus says, uh, what is it in John 10, where he says, He gives his sheep eternal life and they will not perish. But some people say, yeah, he gives you eternal life, but you can still end up perishing. Like they keep completely contradict what God says all over the place. But there, again, another gospel. It usually has to do with works of some kind. Whether they'll say, oh, it's not, like the Catholics will say, oh, you're not under the law, but you got to keep the Ten Commandments or you're going to be lost. So they, they speak with a forked tongue where they're like, oh, yeah, we agree with you. We're not under the law. Oh, so I'm not required to keep the law to be saved. Well, if you don't keep the Ten Commandments, you'll be lost. You definitely aren't going to be saved. Well, that means I'm under the law. And I have to keep it, and I'm going to be judged by it. You see that they pervert the gospel of Christ. And you can tell a lot with that forked tongue flapping around when they contradict themselves. Because the Catholics will also say, oh, it's grace and works. You receive the grace to do the works. Right? 
And they'll take something like, do I have it right here? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Or I already read to you verses 8 and 9. This is, it tells you how you're saved, not by works. Right? It's a gift of God. Then it tells us at verse 10 that we should do good works. But it doesn't say, hey, you've got to do these good works to prove you're saved, to get saved, or to keep your salvation. This is why God saved you, is to do good works. But that doesn't mean you have to do the good works to be saved. Like, I don't do these videos to be saved. I do these videos because I actually enjoy it. I want to help others. And when I pray and I read the word, and I get excited when I start to see all the connections. I start to understand God better. And I want to just share with everybody, help them better understand. So with all that being said, are you following another gospel? Has it removed you from the grace of Christ? Where it's no longer about it being a free, unearned gift, but now you have to do something to earn it and deserve it. Right? They'll say, oh yeah, you get this gift by grace, but now you have to earn and deserve it. It's free, but now you've got to pay for it. No, you don't. God's not a fork-tongue liar like that. He's not a car salesman that does a bait-and-switch like that. That says, oh, I saved you by free, by this free gift. And now that I, you took it, now I'm going to require this large payment from you. You make God out to be a snake. Excuse me. And that's what they do. They pervert the good news of Christ. Well, it's no longer good news. I've talked to some of these people. I ask them, what's the gospel? You know what they tell me? They'll bring up something like Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 18, where he's talking to the rich young ruler, and they'll say, you want to enter life? Keep the commandments. So I'll be like, so the good news is to keep the Ten Commandments, and you'll be saved? And so that's what the apostles were preaching to the whole world, was keep the Ten Commandments, and you'll be saved? That's the good news. Woo! When that was pretty much the news before Jesus showed up. Keep the Ten Commandments, you'll be saved. You know, you see, it's another gospel. Because again, it's about you and what you do. Jesus was talking to a man under the law before he died on the cross, before grace is given. Because the grace comes from God, from Jesus Christ at the cross, his sacrifice, because he pays for all the wrong. Just like we're told in John chapter 1, I believe it's at verse 17, where we're told that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So you need to rightly divide the word of God and understand where Jesus is talking to Jews under the law, under the old covenant, and discern what is actually applying to Christians after the cross, not under the law, but under grace. Being under the law would be under works. You see, they're two different covenants, two different testaments, two different groups of people. One is the kingdom of heaven, the other is the kingdom of God. You're supposed to live off of every word of God. So when you see a word and you notice, hey, well, here it says kingdom of heaven, but all of a sudden the kingdom of God. Why isn't it called the kingdom of heaven here? Why is it the kingdom of God? Why do I assume it's the same thing? Is it the same thing? And then you study it and you realize, oh, the kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom of Israel over there in the Middle East, where the Jerusalem has its capital. And then you go, the kingdom of God doesn't come by sight. It's not by observation within you. And flesh and blood doesn't inherit it. It's a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of the Christian. And then you say, oh, but they're very similar where the Jews were supposed to get both kingdoms, but they ended up rejecting. Right? And then it's like, okay, I see what's going on here. It's like Esau. He was supposed to get the blessing of the firstborn, right? Being Israel, but he rejected it. And then Jacob, the secondborn, the Christian, ends up getting that blessing because he rejected it. You get that? See that there? With all that being said, thanks for watching, 
and take care.